afternoon. Would the guests please rise and join in singing the processional hymn, Onward Christian Soldiers. The words are in an insert in your uh, program, and we ran out of program, so please share. Thank you. Thank you. 
Good afternoon. My name is Gail Merseth. I was a friend of Les's for 40 years here in Cambridge. On behalf of the family, I'd like to welcome you to this celebration of Les's life. This place is especially appropriate since 38 years ago, Les and Susan were married in the Appleton Chapel, and his daughter Emily and grandson Dominic were christened there. Les, along with many others, was saddened by the recent loss of Peter Gomes, the minister here, for many years. As a speaker himself, Les was intrigued by Peter's approach to giving a sermon and his interpretation of religion. Over the years, they had some good debates on the street and in Peter's office. As we begin, I'd like to say two things. First, as a lasting tribute to Les, a fund has been set up in his name to ensure his methods of teaching will continue to be available through videos, tapes, and his books. And secondly, we're following a script today that Les himself had wanted. He said this day should be joyful, a bit unexpected, and above all, humorous and not laudatory. These requests were made over the years, more often than not in Les's usual style of short notes on previously discarded paper rescued from the wastebasket. So with his wishes in mind, let us now enjoy our recollections of Dr. Leston Laycock Havens. Hello, my name is Rick Larson, and um, while my remarks are labeled Williams and Tennis, my connection to Les's college years are tenuous at best. Uh, I, got to, uh, I did go to Williams, but I was born in 1947, the year he graduated. Uh, but it is interesting what I have learned about his college years in the outpouring of powerful feelings and messages we have all received since his death. Uh, you will note that things he participated in at Williams were repeated in some form throughout his life. He was on the debating team, winning an award for extemporaneous speaking. He was a member and president of Phi Beta Kappa and went to its Washington headquarters to protest when an applicant was refused, uh, refused admission for some spurious reason. He was head of the philosophy study group that recruited speakers for the college. His major was English, literature, and American history. What Les and I did share across three decades was a real love of our experiences at Williams and the, and the fact that we had both been taught tennis at a very young age. It was like second nature to us and a key part of the rest of our lives. Les played on the Williams tennis team from the moment he arrived and nobody ever looked better in shorts. What legs? Even when he was old, his legs were great. After Williams, he maintained his high level of achievement on the court and was the tennis pro at the Bridgehampton Tennis Club, where his family had summered since he was a boy and his job had been to roll the clay courts. He played at the Heights Casino in Brooklyn during the winter and then when he, in Newton when he moved to Massachusetts until he moved to Cambridge. He was a member of the Cambridge Tennis Club from 1973 to 2008. During that time, he entered the New England Senior Doubles Championships with, Dick, uh, with Nick Newman. Uh, they were unseated and won. Uh, Les and I met at the Cambridge Tennis Club back in 1973 and began a quarter century of doubles together. We played against great cast of characters, some of whom are here today. Ted Sexton, Peter Ambler, Rick Hunt, Norman Sherry, Stan Farwan, Joe Green, to name a few. It was wonderful to see how it, uh, it annoyed our opponents that Les never, never really had to move much on the court. Why? Because he anticipated every shot that came his way. As we all know, Les had a big heart. <laughs> and one of the reasons he was, um, he was the best doubles player partner I ever had, and it was because of that heart. He was that truly rare competitor who could revel in an opponent's uh, success even as he thrilled to, to win each point. He played until he was 80, when he simply could not play the game anymore, uh, and still he flew off to keep his racket. 
Most important, on the court, he was always a gentleman, but with a mischievous nature that made every match interesting. Our between points conversations were some of the best I ever had. Not to steal anyone's thunder, but I think he did some of his best professional work on the tennis court. When he cocked that head of his to the side, you knew that you were about to get a little bit of incisive wisdom, uh, whether it was about the jerk on the other side of the net, love, sex, or world peace. We Norwegians have a phrase we use when talking about our death process. It begins, when I go to my father's. Well, when I go to my father's, unless it's going to be one of them. Thank you. Hi, I'm Chris Havens. Uh, I'd like to thank the Academy. For, oh, oh, sorry, it's the wrong speaker. Um, first, uh, in this political year, let me acknowledge the presence of the Governor and First Lady, for whom I had the honor of voting for President in 1988. Uh, many active Cambridge politicos are here, Nancy Sensenbaugh and more, all still fighting the good fight. My father wasn't a political animal, yet he expanded the space for those kinds of ideas and all of our ideas during the 1960s. Uh, one of our victories here today, Norman Aaron Finker here today, one of our victories in the political arena in the 60s. Um, without rehashing the yin and yang of that overhyped decade, let me speak of the wonderful freedom of mind that came forth then all over the world, including Newton, Massachusetts. Dad had many friends and colleagues who enriched his life who gave him ideas and with him, whom he exchanged and enlarged his own ideas. Many of you are here today. I believe his work and life in the 1960s were the foundation that led to his remarkable series of articles and books in the 70s and 80s. Our little world of West Newton had so many men and women of ambition, intellect, and attainment, covering the creative, intellectual, and religious worlds. Writers and doctors, artists and clergymen, working hard and playing hard. While my father was not a party animal, he was in a special place to live, work, and create. Tennis, as you've heard about, at which he was quite good, was his social time. His doubles partner and close friend, Danny Rothenberg, here today, is a creative and dynamic real estate wizard straight out of a Saul Bellow novel and a devoted friend of our family. For many years, Danny and Dad took long walks, enjoying, enlightening, and forming each other. Pete Gurney, better known as the playwright A.R. Gurney, was also a tennis man and taught English at MIT at the beginning of his career. Pete told us how much my father encouraged his early writing, which was then avant-garde work we went to see in downtown Boston. Pete threw questions at him constantly and expressed doubt about psychoanalysis which dad was bound to defend, at the same time sharing that doubt while practicing psychoanalysis. My cousin, brother, Mark Finn's father, once dad's dad, what analysis was really like. This was at Christmas time, and we were sitting there. My father said he didn't know, as his first doc said nothing whatsoever, and his second analyst yelled at him all the time. <laughs> Grace Episcopal Church and Reverend Tom Lehman were greatly respected by my father then, yet our church-going community was in many ways morally led by the MIT chaplain, author, and teacher, Myron Bloy, whose children are with our family today and part of our family. Myron was a passionate advocate for justice, God's existence, and the perfectibility of man. You can imagine my dad's mix of agreement and skepticism given the public's mental health experience a half a century ago wasn't very supportive of those ideals, nor it is today. Myron and Don Schoen, a serious intellectual teaching at MIT as well, whose wife Nancy and daughters Ellen and Susan are here today, formed a mini debating society with my father covering every concern. The Schoen's house was an art gallery then, and now Nancy is a practicing artist today. Don and Dad engaged in a decades-long dialogue. Don noted in his book, The Reflective Practitioner, how my father's development of a systemic eclecticism made some sense of the babble of voices in psychiatry. 
This is the sense both he and you try to make of the babble of voices today, both in the profession and in your patients' minds. Dad's life revolved around books, making for his family a world of books and magazines. We really read and collect books today. How could we not surround it both by those books and the flood of wonderful magazines? I don't know why I always think of this, but it's always the New Yorker, Life, Look, Time, when that got too conservative, Newsweek, Scientific American, New England Journal of Medicine, many more, and the Daily New York Times and the Boston Globe. Recalling Steve Greenberg's hilarious speech, some of which you heard at Dad's retirement roast, where he told stories about my father on the theme of the frozen and the chosen. I think back to the 60s, a time of a new and growing relationship between our two tribes, very much active in Newton at that time. Dad was among those leading that mix, making our lives bigger and better, changing how we saw the world and leaving behind the narrow 1950s. He engaged all of us seriously and did so all of his life. His friends did the same, talking to us outspoken teenagers, honestly, arguing us and teaching us. Myron Bloy once said, you know, you don't believe in God, let's go up a mountain with a bottle of bourbon and, you know, I'll straighten that out. <laughs> True story, in his kitchen. To me, our most significant inheritances from him are both an attitude of mind and an effectiveness of language. Open-mindedness in short supply today burst forth brilliantly then. During the 60s, a hinge in history of great and wrenching change my father created a safe place. Our father created a safe place to give both our ideas and our ideals a chance, rejecting dogma and dead stop ideology, using effective language to get close to human truth. He taught us we must never stop reaching for that truth, if only because we will never know if we got there. God bless. Good afternoon. I'm Susan Strang. Les and I were colleagues at Cambridge Hospital for several years, and our families have been friends for many years. Not long ago, I was asked to undertake the task of helping the family with Les's papers and drafts. We started off with two modest file cabinets on the second floor at 151, and then I was told that perhaps I hadn't been given the full truth. So into the basement we went, and there they stood, six or eight, I can't remember, tall four-drawer gray-black file cabinets looming in the basement light. Well, it was a privilege and an honor to go through all those drafts of his own work, the drafts that many colleagues and friends here today sent to him for comments, the notes on top of the drafts, the correspondence, it was so rich and wonderful. And as a result, there's a particular gem that I've been asked to share with you today. And it is some correspondence between the late Cedric Edward Kennedy and Les. And the first letter begins deliciously. Dear Ted, I am writing because of the coming senatorial election and out of my interest in rehabilitation. I am the chief psychiatric consultant of the Mass Rehab Commission and in charge of training rehabilitation counselors at the Harvard Medical School. I'm very interested in knowing what policies and attitudes you have had to formulate in relation to rehabilitation problems. In one of the recent debates, you mentioned your interest in retraining unemployed workers. And there are, as you know, also rehabilitation problems in relation to other welfare cases, social security cases, the mentally ill, and the retarded, and a number of other groups. One significant problem, for example, is the current difficulty in getting adequate medical treatment, especially for mentally disabled people. I appreciate how intensely busy you must be these days, but hope that you will have a chance to give this at least some attention. This is a letter from 1962. And there is a rather quick reply. Dear Dr. Havens, 
I want to thank you very kindly for your most informative letter of September concerning the problems of rehabilitation involved in welfare and other cases. As president of the Joseph P. Kennedy Foundation, I have been immensely interested and concerned in how these problems can best be met. Needless to say, I am fully aware of the necessity of making maximum use of the potential of those people who've been unfortunate enough to suffer from mental illness. I certainly think that this problem should be considered as part of the overall need for manpower retraining. I should be delighted to have the benefit of your own views on this important question, and I hope that you will not hesitate to write me further. Furthermore, I would be happy to arrange a meeting with my associates, although I would very much like to have such a discussion with you personally. However, as I'm sure you can understand, my schedule requires me to spend a considerable amount of time away from my office. I am looking forward to the pleasure of hearing from you in the future with best wishes sincerely, Edward Kennedy. And the last reply has the heart of the matter. Dear Mr. Kennedy, thank you for your letter. I am writing at this time to mention to you three or four principles which I am eager to introduce into your thinking if they are not already firmly planted there. I do not intend to present them here in any detail, although a time will undoubtedly come at your convenience and as you suggest when I might be worth discussing them with you. The interest in rehabilitation is spreading very widely, not only into concern for the mentally ill, but also concern with welfare cases, social security, and of course, into the prisons. So many of these problems are ones that stir up special feeling that I know it is going to require a great deal of courageous leadership to be sure that sound principles are followed. Heaven knows I have no monopoly on sound principles, but I did want to list here a few things that seem to me of central importance. The ex number one, the extension of the rehabilitation idea to more and more groups of our citizens is going to require an extensive educational effort to prepare government workers to deal wisely with the people involved. Number two, many of our civil service arrangements will need to be thought through again if the human needs to be met are not to be cut off because of difficult administrative procedures. Three, much political leadership will be needed to deal with the accusations that have brought, been brought against welfare, that it encourages chiseling and dependency. The fundamental problem is how to give people help without hurting them. Because we are committed on a broad scale to caring for our people with the resources at our rich country's command, there is no question of our turning back away from assistance to the needy and disabled. There is a question, however, as to whether we are going to undertake it legalistically and mechanically or with understanding of the special psychological problems involved. I hope these matters do not seem intrusive at this very busy time in your life, but that they might bear fruit in your thinking and in the years of work ahead. The wonderful thing is that Les really believed that for each of us there was a new day, a new dawn, a new life perhaps, and he wished that not only for his family, his patients, his colleagues and his friends, he wished it for everyone, for everyone. And as we gather today, this beloved community, in this year, and see a broken world, we should remember that in the next breeze, in the next turn of the calendar page, there might be something better for each and every one of us. And every time we have that thought and feel that way about our fellow citizens, as well as our colleagues and our friends and our families, every time we feel that that's what everyone deserves, we honor less than havens. May it always be so. Good afternoon. I'm Ed Hundert, a lifelong student of Les's. One of Les's many legacies is the legion of, of us psychiatrists who, as medical students, took an elective reading with Les. 
Quick show of hands, how many people here at some point did some reading with less? Look at that. Connected to every one of those hands is a memorable and meaningful story that could be told here today. And I know my month reading with less led to almost 10 years of monthly faculty club uh, lunches together where Les encouraged me and prodded me and constantly encouraged me to feel like I could accomplish so much more than I ever thought possible. But my charge today is to focus on that reading month, how profound it was for us medical students to have our guru give us his deep personal attention as we discussed our reading together. I learned about read Les's reading elective from a fellow student just before a conference where Les was coming to interview a patient chosen because none of the residents had been able to get so much as even a basic history from this poor woman whose experience was so completely filled with terrifying hallucinations. Les came in, pulled his chair up next to hers, and within a few minutes proceeded to have about a half hour pretty normal conversation about who she was and her life and she talked about how she had worked as a clerk at the MIT Coop, and she remembered selling the very last, last slide rule that they stocked before calculators came in. Afterward, Les took questions, and one of the residents asked why he thought that patients who hear voices so often think that it's the voice of God that they hear. He paused and then said, you know, there are a lot of kinds of suffering physical pain, for example. But the kind of suffering that our patients experience really is the worst kind of human suffering. And God doesn't talk to just anyone. And he just left it there. So the next time I spotted him on the ward, I raced over and asked if I could sign up for one of his reading months. He said he would look forward to it and um, he later let me know that I should read in advance the book that we would discuss at the first session together, Carl Jasper's General Psychopathology. So I wondered, do current medical students actually read through the General Psychopathology and discuss it with their professors? And if not, what does that singular change mean for psychiatry? Well, after we discussed Jasper's, he assigned me John William Miller's In Defense of the Psychological, which affected my thinking more than I think any other single book I'd ever read. These were like classic Oxford tutorials, where the wise tutor listens to his young charge discuss the last reading, and then chooses the next reading, based both on appreciation of the student's ongoing misconceptions, and on insight into which texts will best challenge the student's growth to the next level of understanding. It was during our discussion of In Defense of the Psychological that I confided to Les that I had a contract with Oxford Press to write a book on various approaches to the mind. And he replied, well, in that case, maybe the next thing we should discuss together is a little effort I cobbled together with that same title. <laughs> and so we moved on to his approaches to the mind and my life was never the same. Now, my hypothesis was that Les used these reading months to size us up, you know, to sort us a little bit like Hogwarts sorting hat, with Les as Dumbledore thinking through, you know, which type of psychiatry, which residency and training director would be the right fit for each of us. Now, Les made it pretty clear that he didn't want a lot of mushy talks at moments like this, as was said. You'll recall that he only agreed to that event in 96 if it were done as a roast to make fun of his foibles as we celebrated his contributions. And so for that event, I wrote a poem that I've adop uh, adapted a bit for today. And so I'll finish with an ode to Leston. This celebration of Les Haven's life, his friendships, his students, and his great works gives us cause not just to honor this man, but also to smile as we remember his quirks. A teacher, a mentor, a scholar, a sage, Les Haven's roles filled crannies and nooks, a clinical wizard and prolific writer of dust jacket blurbs for other folks' books. Like so many others here in this room, I first met Les when in student days, I spent a month reading a few classic texts, 
and found myself under his quizzical gaze. Does some message lurk in those odd facial frowns? I wondered in each of my weekly trips. And why, after each time he described someone as truly remarkable, did he pout his lips? And who but Les Havens could get away with such lines that he often was heard out to toss? Like, did you read last week's London Review? Or, I was just rereading some Habermas. Les's distinctive love-hate relation with psychoanalysis was one of his hooks. But humans are complex. Three words, incidentally, which also summarize all of his books. What was the secret of this man's great gift for nurturing growth in the careers of hundreds of students and colleagues he helped learn to be human over the years? Was it creation of a safe place to make contact with empathy rife and approach the mind of each willing victim, this participant observer coming to life? I think it was Les's unique combination of a seriousness that bound him so tightly along with his favorite Chesterton line, that angels can fly because they take themselves lightly. So when they look back on the century just ended, their history will likely divide into three, the badges of honor claimed by the people who practice the art of psychotherapy. Those in the first generations claimed Freud, provided them personal couch space rental, then came the years of those who claimed proudly they trained under Simrad out at Mass Mental. But the last third of the 20th century will be marked by generations now destined to talk not of Sigmund or Elvin, but rather the month in med school when I read with Leston. Susan had asked me to tell a couple of vignettes from my training, so I'll do that. I, I first met Les when I was 30 years old. I had worked hard to become a medical doctor, and my internship year at Cambridge Hospital had been the most difficult year of my life. It was so in the sense that my time and my being had not been my own. 
I had felt owned and used by others, almost a prisoner or slave to the clinical service needs of a city hospital. I'd served my time and bowed to my various guards and the warden. Now I was about to become a psychiatrist, to begin training. My desire to become a psychiatrist had been my major goal for many years. One morning in late June of 1984, Les met with seven new PGY2 residents in a conference room in the old mocked building. He made a speech to us that went something along these lines. Welcome to Cambridge Hospital. It's the best of the teaching programs at Harvard. I was at Mass Mental for a while, and for a long time, it was the top Harvard program. <laughs> but now, I think Cambridge Hospital, it's definitely the best. He gave some reasons for his determination, mentioning some of the great figures in which they each represented, indicating that his proclamation was carefully considered and accurate. You, and he stared around the room at each of us, you're the best residents in the Harvard programs, and we have important work to do here. So, the first thing you need to know is that I'll need you to lie to your supervisors. <laughs> we residents exchanged glances with each other nervously. Was this some first day test of our moral fiber? Were we supposed to shout out, no, no, we won't lie, no, never? Was this guy nuts? <laughs> this isn't the Boy Scouts, he went on. You're taking care of patients and lives are at stake. If you don't lie to your supervisors, they'll steer you down some well-worn path of their own prejudice and you'll never learn how to help your patients. You have the talent to do what's needed, but you'll never do it by trying to figure out what your supervisors want to hear and mimicking them like monkeys. All right? Instead, tell them what they want to hear. Then create some working space for you and your patient and try out what you think will work. Then see what actually works. Discover what works. That's how we'll advance the field. That's what we need you to do. Wow, my shackles have just been cut. But would this guy, Havens, lead me down the road to perdition? I felt joy and excitement for what we were about to do. This was the first of a number of experiences I had with Les, where he said something succinct and startling. He often communicated that way. No one I had ever met did this. One would not be sure why he said it and what he meant completely, but when he applied it in the right situation, it worked. At times, we would ask him about these statements, and his usual explanations were actually quite sensible, based on a deep understanding of human nature, a scholar's command of a vast psychotherapeutic and philosophical literature. And then his utterance was distilled into one comment or phrase, uttered with just the right affect, and it achieved so much calmed a patient, helped a person feel less alone, got young doctors to think. I'll give one more example. I was chief resident on the inpatient psychiatric unit at Cambridge Hospital. I supervised two PGY2 residents. A manic woman in her 40s was a patient on the unit. She would not leave me alone. She followed me everywhere constantly talking to me loudly and badgering me, putting her face inches away from mine. She wouldn't take any medication, and she wouldn't cooperate with the PGY2 resident or anyone else on the unit. She was very invasive. I walked into a therapy room where Les was waiting to give me my weekly hour of supervision. He asked, how can I help you? I explained that this patient 
was torturing me from the moment I walked onto the floor until the moment I left. I gave him the history. Less thought about it. Then he said, mania is the most difficult condition to address through language. Much more difficult than paranoia or depression. Despite the low probability that he'd be able to help me, he'd give it a try. He said, we need to be brief. We'll need something clear and simple. And said with strong emotion, I'll think of something. Just as um, he said that, he was seated over here on the left corner of the room. I was here, and the door was here, and the woman who was going through the manic episode burst in at me. You know, she saw me through a window in the door. Um, the manic woman burst in, began to rail against me, as was her custom. Les sat in that far corner, right over here, looking down at the floor. He said in a moderate volume and with an angry voice, shit, shit. He just looked at the floor and every five to 10 seconds, he repeated the word shit, shit. Not looking up, just off in the corner. After a few of these expletives, the woman stopped haranguing me and looked up at him. Who is that man? She demanded. That's Havens, I said. Wes kept saying, shit, shit. And he kept looking at the floor. What's he doing here? She asked indignantly. He's a psychiatrist who tries to help me, I said. She looked angry and left the room. Les said, well, I don't know if that did any good. <laughs> I just looked at him, not asking any more questions. <laughs> My supervision was over, so I went to the community meeting. The man and woman decided to come to the community meeting for the first time. And when the medical director of the um, unit convened the meeting, she raised her hand. Again, this was totally new behavior. When the medical director called on her, she said, can everyone here read that sign over the door? It had the symbol of radiation on it, and it said something like, people's feelings, be careful of them. So she pointed everyone's attention to it. The manic woman said, people do have feelings. We all have feelings and everyone on this unit should be careful of them. There is a Harvard professor on this unit, the one with the patches on his sleeves, and he swears. Someone should do something about it. That's not right. The manic woman stopped bothering me after that, and she began cooperating with her PGY2 resident. She continued to complain about the Harvard professor with the patches on his sleeves. But she focused now on what she had to do to get her mania under control and to get on with her life. Later that week, I told Dan Brown, an exceptionally intelligent and talented clinical psychologist who supervised me on an outpatient case about this incident with the manic woman and Les. Dan laughed and said, you and I and the rest of us are doing psychotherapy 101. Havens is working on the 400 level courses. <laughs> Les taught each of us so much he was kind, funny, loving, and strong. Les, you're alive in the work we do each day, and you'll always be the lion in my heart. Hello, Peter Kramer, another student since medical school days. How to epitomize an original. Eulogizing Thoreau 
Emerson began, it was a pleasure and privilege to walk with him. For his fellow writers, it was a pleasure and privilege to walk with Les. Our walks began in my medical school years. In all weather, we tramped the fens, considering readings Les had assigned and writing I hoped to complete. When we were separated by distance and my essays appeared in print, Les sent terse Delphic notes. In response to one long piece, he said, go on and on. I thought, do I? And tightened the prose. On my return to New England, we had a fateful walk in Providence. I said that I was considering abandoning academics to gain the freedom to write, but that to do so would be crazy. Les said, that's who does write. On another walk, Les gave me the key to listening to Prozac. I was struggling to name a response patients had to the new antidepressants. Les said, courage. That was what the medication supplied, what I required, and what Les offered in the moment. I don't mean to make Les out as a coiner of ambiguous pronouncements only. He shared generously the workings of his mind. He made psychotherapy out as a sublime art, sometimes noble in its heritage, often humbling and demanding of humility, but approachable with skills you had to hand. Writing about it might be too. He, meant, he mentored dozens of young writers in this way. Les was a man of integrity in every sense. His therapy, teaching, and writing are of a piece, which is to say that he's with us still through his books especially. It's hard to recall, perhaps, and then hard to overstate how courageous he was in his first book, Approaches to the Mind. When orthodoxy was a requirement for advancement, Les presented Freud as a proponent of one perspective among many needed for patient care and an understanding of the species. In his next book, Participant Observation, Les turned to Harry Stack Sullivan, finding in his therapy a characteristic position beside the patient looking out at the world, a technique, counter-projection, confounding expectations, and an attitude, an agnostic's curiosity, grounded in awareness that we do not know people until they gain the freedom to speak. These tools constituted an answer to questions that would pervade Les's work if abandonment and psychological trespass are the risks of intimacy, how do we reach the other? How do we signal our intent not to possess, but to encourage? Les also found his own voice. His prose is compact and humorous, composed and intuitive. We read less slowly because the sentence that follows on is rarely the one we expect. And Les is like Sullivan as Les characterized him, one of the very, very few psychiatric writers who can be funny on purpose. It was Les's uncle, the art historian Lloyd Goodrich, who encouraged him to write daily and to approach the same subject repeatedly. With the Sullivan volume, Les's next four books form one multifaceted text about how to help patients achieve self-possession. The books confront the problem of evil, and in particular of vulnerability and domination. By way of mitigation, Les suggested approaching with courtesy, monitoring distance, oscillating between empathy and skepticism, and using language and silence to counter presumptions without presuming. Cultivating his plot of ground, Les makes his claim as philosopher and champion of freedom. So that we can hear Les again, I will end as Emerson ended, with the late friend's words. Lessons are from the masterworks, making contact, a safe place, coming to life, and learning to be human. I have snuck in one sentence quoted by Les from Joseph Conrad, the author with whose work Les most wanted his own to be of a piece. I can walk on your land if I secure your permission and practice respect of its contents. These simple rules do not now obtain between minds. Few men realize that their life, the very essence of their character, their capabilities, and their audacities are only the expression of their belief in the safety of their surroundings. When the therapist tries to reach the imprisoned person, he must first realize that there is no representative body to contact. In essence, it is necessary for the therapist to bring into being a provisional government with which he can deal. Much is outrageous and potentially violent in any point of view 
that attempts to be more than just one of many perspectives on a mysterious and largely invisible world. I judge the success of psychotherapy in two ways. Does the patient's appearance change? Does he get new friends? We need someone enough like us to share our feelings and sufferings and different enough to have a separate perspective. It's like going on a picnic. You want someone else along, but not a bear or a lizard. How do you give someone freedom? Don't they have to take it? Don't they have to rest it away? Set yourself not to possess or abuse or escape another human being, and you see quickly the thin curtain separating our hope of civilization from the savage practices of slavery and cannibalism. In a difficult time of my own, I coined a saying, the unexpected is the only thing that happens. It's a paradoxical source of tranquility to know that we live close to failure and death. And let's end with this one. The means I offer are directed against absence, isolation, submission, and domination. They are a means by which human presence is discovered and defined, and a weapon in the constant struggle for existence. My name is Marie Harberger, and <clears throat> Les Havens was my friend. It's a privilege to share and honor him with you all today, but I admit that I have been humbled and anxious in the face of my task to talk about Les and his work as a therapist, because it is like trying to describe some shining, brilliant light. For years to come, his work will be studied and shared by far greater minds than mine, and with that endeavor, his legacy will likely grow and continue to shine. But I think that Les would have said that therapy is a friendly business. He surely approached it with the warmth and devotion that I knew him to bring to friendship. He was my friend for 40 years, most of my life. There were moments along that way when after some stunning encounter or other, I would think to myself that perhaps Les knew me better than I knew myself. But thinking that way was a disservice to his intention. What he was really evoking was a sort of introduction to oneself, to one's own wisdom and inner experience. In effect, he would be calling one home to one's own awareness. I do believe that Les Havens was the most empowering person I've ever known. Perhaps the seed of this was in his nature, a gift. But when he became a devoted scholar of the human condition, that gift was nurtured into an extraordinary talent. Les had an enormous respect for the innovators in the world of psychiatry, he could hold forth spontaneously and like no other on the influence of Freud, Jung, Sullivan, Kohut, and others. But it was he who took their clear notes, the sharps, the flats, and composed them into a symphony of skill that he brought to his own work. Les opened the metaphorical door to his office to me when I was very young and new in the business of being a therapist. He would refer to me some of his own patients, and we would work with them together. Like so many of you, my work today is in many ways an homage to his generosity. He once said that he thought of every interview as providing an opportunity for something helpful to happen. As therapists, he would say, we have to speak for the patient's suffering. We have to size up their particular difficulties, embrace the mysteries, find the darkness, and bring some zest to the experience of bearing it, sorting it, and making sense. He said, you occupy the ground of their concern more voluminously than they do, than they know you know. Our patients need to be comforted by our presence, while at the same time disconcerted. 
And this great man himself lived and worked by those words. Lucky was a concept that I remember less having liked. Some of us were lucky in this life, some of us not. But he did not allow this notion to compromise his momentum in the business of empowering his patients, speaking directly to their power. If you were unlucky, you could not find a better embrace than that of this man. But if you were lucky and lived some version of yourself as unlucky, he would call you out. He would say something like, I hope you're not going to go around finding even more people to abuse you. You know, there are lots of them around. You can find them. Or, how are we going to get this stuff out of your head? Or, one I'm sure was probably pretty frequent in his repertoire. What, don't you know what you're like? When I think of Les in the proverbial chair, this is what I remember, his ease. He always said that the therapist had to be comfortable in order to seek souls. His laugh, that twinkle. His listening, I believe he paid attention like no other. His subtlety, his power could be unspeakably quiet. Truth, he always told the truth. He answered patients' questions, not with a question, but with an answer. Respect. He was flawlessly respectful. With that, his patients were invited to take responsibility without shame. That is a tall order and a great skill. Courage. I think he was fearless. He evoked a feeling that he could hear and bear anything. His strength, one felt, was for sharing. And patience. Patience is an act of faith, after all. I think Les could abide with such remarkable patience in his work because he so very deeply believed in a healing outcome. With his hallmark generosity, Les has left us a profound legacy in the understanding of psychotherapy and its power to make different and better the lives of so many. Perhaps it is now our mandate to hold him in our hearts and pay him forward as we live and work. For his presence, his gifts, and his touching us all in one way or another, we are, well, after all, very, very lucky.
Good afternoon. My name is uh, Nicholas and I'm Leston Haven's eldest grandson. I'm going to read to you today a poem he wrote to me on my christening in August 1993. Like your father and mother, there may be nothing you cannot do. Already, the great spirit moves your little arms and legs. And your mind goes out with those eager hands to grasp the world. You are not casually amused. No careless thoughts preoccupy that grave brow. No, you are serious without being solemn and involved, not merely occupied. I wonder what you will make of the world, the perplexing world, with its silences and ambiguities. I predict a light, a bright, clear light shining from you. Thank you. Hello, um, I'm Dominic, your second grandson, and this was written for me just before my first birthday, uh, August 1995. Young man, so solid with good humour and comfort, will you cheer all the serious ones up, your grandfather too, and match Nicholas's clear light with a laughing beam beside it to show the balance of life, that nothing is quite what it seems. Hello, I'm Benjamin Sander, the youngest grandson, um, and this is a poem that he wrote me on my fourth birthday in 2001. And, uh, Young man, so settled, so steady, like your father, do you really see with clear eyes, did you from the beginning grasp the essential impatience of humanity? It is possible. I envy that. I look on you with astonishment that people could be born into a world they understand. Often I think your mother is like that. Time will test you, and your brothers too, but it is possible your good sense will prevail. Then we will all learn. Thank you. Jennifer Havens, Les's oldest daughter. I just want to know, all the shrinks in the room, I have you beat. When I was in my early 20s, before I went to medical school, living in Boston, I started re reading Les's works. I think I've read them all, at least once. I worked close enough to Mass Mental to go visit him when he was there as the training director, and several times watched him to his miraculous interviews with the very challenging patients his trainees would present to him. You've heard a lot about the impact he's had on generations of psychiatrists. As I moved into my own psychiatric training at Cornell in New York City in the 80s, I realized I had absorbed a kind of protective clarity about what was at the core of the work. As Les so often pointed out, our field is young and sometimes muddled, torn between the biological and the psychological, without clear tests of normality or health. How we approach the patient often gets lost in trying to nail down the problem and fix it. In his erudite and technically detailed way, Les taught me and many, many other people what was at the heart of the work, finding another person and bringing them to safety. I believe this is the source of his extraordinary influence on the field. He kept us all in touch with the soul of psychiatry. Now let me talk about Les as a father. Les loved his family. He loved his children deeply. And when Les loved you, he loved you with a strong and deep pride and a ferocious loyalty. I want to tell a couple of stories. When I defended my honors thesis in psychology at Smith, Les came to visit me. He would often come to visit me at Smith, and being the quintessential wasp, he would wait till the chicken salad with grapes was on the menu and drive out to Northampton. <laughs> this time, however, unfortunately, there was a picnic because it was graduation week, and as the faculty of the Department of Psychology came in to hear my oral defense, one of them had the audacity to actually bring food and sit down and eat it. I had to hold less back. 
Another story, and I have permission to tell the story. When my ex-husband and I, Peter, who's here, split up, Les absolutely refused to talk to Peter. I begged with him, I pleaded with him. Uh, Les was a very important person in Peter's, wife, in Peter's life. They'd worked together, written papers together. He said, absolutely not. I'm with you. <laughs> when, I, when I left Columbia after many years and went to Bellevue to run child psychiatry, which is where I am now, my father was bursting with pride. He said, you are going to one of the great, great places in American psychiatry. And it's the only place, Jen, I regret never having worked. And he was just beaming. Now, for all of Les's wonderful qualities, I know I speak for myself and my siblings when I say sometimes Les could be a little much. <laughs> he was always, always trying to be helpful, as you've heard from other people, even when you didn't want him to. In the end of his life, something happened, which was a great gift to all of us who loved him so much. As he gradually lost his cognitive capacities, he lost his ability to control every single interaction he ever had with anyone. Something emerged. There was this sweet, open man who just wanted the people he loved around him. Behind that amazing intellectual force, behind that incisive, probing soul, was a man just overflowing with love. Daddy, we're comforted by the fact that you're with Jeffrey now, but we will all miss you terribly. My name is Bob Michaels. I'm a psychiatrist in New York City. Following his undergraduate work at Williams, Les went to Cornell Medical College. He graduated in 1952 and spent two years as a medicine intern and resident there afterwards, before settling at Harvard for the rest of his career. I got to Cornell in 1974, a bit later, and was dean of the medical school that Les graduated in the 90s. We had regular correspondence when I was dean. I wrote him each year asking for a donation and wrote him each year thanking him for his donation. <laughs> However, I'd met him 10 years after he left Cornell in 1964. I remember it vividly. I had not heard of him before, or he of me, I'm sure, but he was my examiner when I first sat for my psychiatry boards. He introduced himself. It seemed like he was trying to allay my anxiety and assuring me about what was about to happen. And I was too anxious to pick up the slight element of perhaps a little bit of hyperbole that we all know familiarly with his style. He told me that he would show me into a room in which there would be a pad of paper and a pencil and a desk that I was free to use and a patient that I was to interview and tried to put me at ease. If I wanted to, I could take notes, he said. He then showed me into the room, and there was indeed two chairs, a desk, a pad of paper, a pencil, and a young, frazzled girl sitting on the floor near the radiator with her head toward the wall. I was a little scared. She looked catatonic and was. Les was watching me closely. He wanted to see what I would do. In the next 10 seconds, I made a quick decision. I ignored the chairs, the desk, the pad of paper, the pencil, and I walked over and sat next to her on the floor. I said, you look like you're frightened. I'm frightened too. I think I passed that second with less. It might have taken a while before I passed the boards. He asked me lots of questions. I gave him lots of answers. Both of us knew how to do that, and both did it well. But the key thing was I made contact with the girl, and in the process with Les. We began a lifelong friendship and correspondence that continued for decades. In 1976, 
I wrote a review of his book, Participant Observation. I said then, Havens envisions a psychotherapy that is thoughtfully pluralistic rather than arbitrarily eclectic, with each of the schools seen as offering methods of specific value. I can't imagine less ever liking the word eclectic. Eclectic means embracing the lowest common denominator. Less embrace the highest possible denominator. He was a master at each rather than someone who combined many. In 1980, he decided to take a sabbatical year at Yale, although he actually never did so. And he sought a grant from the Foundation Fund for Research in Psychiatry. It was 1980 and he was seeking $20,000, the good old days. He asked me to write, and I wrote a letter to Fritz Redlich, then president of the fund. I quote, Dr. Havens is an unusually gifted teacher of clinical psychiatry, a central figure in the education of generations of Harvard medical students, psychiatry residents, and others who trained at the Massachusetts Mental Health Center. He has a special ability to communicate the richness and excitement of the clinical context and to stimulate students who become aware of their own role in it. His writing about the major schools of clinical work has helped to develop the beginnings of a comparative psychiatry, the delineation of the special features of each of the major approaches, along with the essential categories that generate these unique characteristics. Together with this, he has provided some of the clearest expositions in print of the various schools of psychotherapy. His more recent work has concerned the specification of what is actually done in these different schools, the words they use, the questions they ask, the implicit and explicit models that they employ. Dr. Haven's work has not been regarded simply as within any of the particular schools of psychotherapy, but as cutting across them. It's more of a contribution to our understanding of their mutual relationships than to the development of any particular theory. It's a contribution to the comparative sociology and comparative anthropology of psychotherapy, as well as to psychotherapy itself. Les and I met regularly through the years, often around the country. I lived in New York, he in Boston, but I became an examiner in the boards in which he examined me, and we'd meet at board exams. We'd be on scientific programs together at annual meetings. I remember first meeting Susan, if my memory's right, at a dinner in Portland, Oregon, many years ago. But that's another story. He was a master at studying and describing what therapists do, what they actually say, how they sit, where they look, what they must believe, in order to do that kind of thing, rather than the much more popular and easier, but much less important, what they assert their theories to be. Therapists often don't know what their theories really are. He was an extraordinary clinician and teacher. He could see the world through his patient's or student's eyes, and then seduce the patient or student to see it through his eyes. He was extraordinarily seductive, as those of you know who've lived or worked or studied with him. He could pull the student or patient in and not only get them to see the world through his eyes, but when he then shifted his gaze, he could get them to shift with him. We have lost a master.
Good afternoon, my name is Alyssa Kleinman. Les was a beloved and generous mentor for many years. And I have the honor today to present Susan Miller Haven's remarks. Did you know? You may not know that Les was admitted to Yale Law School in order to follow in his father's and uncle's footsteps as New York lawyers. However, the family didn't know he wanted to be a Clarence Darrow representing the underdog, not corporations. Later, he would manifest this passion in his defense of patients against all sorts of life situations and systems. Les loved figuring out strategies. Playing chess and knowing the battle plans for World War II were second nature to him. Did anyone know that he left Williams to join the army in order to kill Hitler? Les learned Japanese and ended up in the South Pacific on the island of Tinian, blowing up ammunition. He taught Shakespeare in an army hospital. One day the class had to be interrupted for surgeons to operate. It was then that he became fascinated with medicine. After the war, he was admitted to Cornell Medical School where he did a residency in internal medicine to prepare himself for studying the relationship between mind and body. It was with dread that he recalled walking down to the hospital where his own father was dying to tell him he had decided to become a physician, only worse, a psychiatrist. <laughs> Maybe you don't know that many of Les's awards were for biological research. As a young psychiatrist at Mass Mental in 1955, Les's first award was not for a psychological discovery, it was for diagnosing a patient as suffering from liver disease and elevated blood ammonia. Everyone thought the patient was just plain psychotic, but Les proved that the liver was the culprit. Les studied the relationship of goosebumps to ECT outcome. He wrote a paper on hallucinations in outer space with the Australian anthropologist John Cott. Les kept most of his awards and trophies in a box because he did not want the children to think that they were something to aim for. He only hung his Elvin Semrad Teaching Award. In 1965, in an unprecedented bow to psychiatry, Les was published in the New England Journal of Medicine and invited by the Mass General to deliver his now pivotal paper, An Anatomy of a Suicide, at Grand Rounds. After the speech in the parking lot, the great cardiologist, Paul Dudley White, ran up behind him saying, Dr. Havens, don't you think if Marilyn Monroe had exercised, she would not have been depressed? Forever interested in the biological and neurological, he noticed when he first became ill that his brain was misfiring in some way that he could not put his finger on. As his vascular disease progressed, he did his best to track it. Although it seemed like a cruel illness for him to have, the irony is that his mind actually got out of the way, so his heart became even more available to all of us. He was able, towards the end of his life, to receive and trust the love that was offered to him in truly wonderful ways. Remember the TV series Northern Exposure? Lester Hayes, the wise Indian chief in scripts written by Dartmouth medical students, was based on Les. What would he think of Skype therapy? Les believed that astrology was an early psychological tool that was accurate. He was a Leo, and yes, he could roar, but then it was over quickly as if nothing had happened. What about when he worked in the coroner's office in Southampton one summer when he was a med student? He watched as the pathologist wrote down, cause of death, stroke. Les, holding a bullet, noting that the deceased had a clear bullet wound in one temple and out the other, questioned the report. The pathologist responded, son, this is just the way it is done here. Clearly, it's a stroke. When he became a professor, he had a letter from the headmaster at the Hotchkiss School saying that the demerit he had received for putting an apple on his windowsill had been removed from his record. <laughs> he loved Williams College and was a Yankee fan most of his life, 
but would not respond to George Steinbrenner's request for alumni donations because there was something about George that made him uneasy. <laughs> Les believed that the rich and famous often got the worst care. The sight of the baseball great Lou Gehrig on the streets of New York had a lasting effect on him. Now a skeleton wearing a huge camel hair coat, this once tall, powerful athlete had found no one to cure him. Les was the youngest person to be nominated to be Commissioner of Mental Health. He didn't want to be an administrator, so he sabotaged the interview over breakfast with Governor and Mrs. Volpe. When Volpe asked what his goal was for mental health in Massachusetts, he said to open all the hospitals and let everyone out. He did not get the job. If Les were here right now, he would leave. <laughs> to something he did not feel like talking about, he would comment, how interesting. In a huge drawer, Les kept every piece of correspondence that his children, Chris, Jeff, Jenny, Sarah, and Emily ever wrote him. Les was more drawn to philosophy than religion, per se, but there were times when Les would say the only thing left to do in a situation was to pray. To complaints made about an impossible person, his response was, we are all God's children, or during the reign of the Boston Strangler, I am sure he came by it honestly. <laughs> I would hear him on the phone over the last three decades saying to an enormous variety of people, well then, let's take a walk around the river. Les never revealed what went on between him and whomever he was walking around the river with. For some, he did not want their privacy to be violated by being seen walking into his office. For others, he simply wanted to walk side by side. I did sense that hundreds of debates were had, decisions were made, and worries quelled. I would like to end by giving you all a message from Les in the form of two passages from his writings. Over and over again I have found that those who claimed to make it alone had behind them parents or friends whose adoring voices were firmly planted in their heads. And those who do not have adoring voices too often hear critical ones stopping them cold in their tracks. As to despair, I want you to know that despair is best spoken, best shared, that it is best divided and apportioned between yourself and someone to be trusted because no one does anything important alone. You see, Les wanted us to replace the critical voices in our heads, to be the adoring voice for someone else and never to go it alone. He encouraged us to set our goals a bit beyond ourselves and he wanted so much for all of us of every age to be free. To be free to escape into our daydreams, to be free to escape from all psychological imprisonment, and most of all, to be free to love and receive love. Les's family invites all of you to join them for a reception at the Harvard Faculty Club following this celebration. And then would everyone please rise and join in singing the recessional when the saints come marching in. Those lyrics are also on the sheet in your program. <laughs> 